Okay, welcome back. We're back. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Last time we were talking about RNA and all things RNA related. Um, in particular today, we're going to be talking about translation of messenger RNA to make proteins. We'll be uh, looking at kind of the intricacies of that, how it's regulated, and um, other aspects. And then uh, we'll look at incorporation of unnatural amino acids into proteins. This is an important frontier. This is an important frontier in chemical biology because it allows us to expand the palette of what's available for doing experiments involving proteins. And proteins uh, do a lot, they have, but they only have 20 functionalities available to them. And in recent years, uh, chemical biologists like Peter Schultz have been inventing ways of expanding that palette to go beyond the naturally occurring 20. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then finally, we'll end today by talking about RNA libraries. Okay, next week we'll be on to, uh, week six, we'll be on to uh, chapter five, protein structure. And uh, again, it'll be two lectures on uh, protein structure. And then we'll be on to chapter six, protein function. And again, it'll be two lectures on that. And we're, we'll just keep rolling them up. Okay, so any questions about where we're going, things like that? All right. Um, okay, some announcements. Uh, I think I already went over these. I don't have to go over them again. I have office hours today. Encourage you to come by. Uh, alternatively, come by to the, the TA's office hours. My office hour next week will be on Wednesday. Uh, I believe it's 2.45 to 3.45. Okay. Um, I already talked about it, letters of recommendation. Uh, some last minute announcements on the book, on the uh, journal article report. Uh, this is going to be due uh, next Thursday, a week from today at 11 a.m. Uh, it is essential that you submit both a hard copy to me and also an electronic version through the turnitin.com website. Um, along those lines, it's not really turned in officially until the hard copy is received and the electronic version. I will not accept any emailed submissions. Okay, there's 120 of you, and uh, I don't want to get 120 PDFs to have to print out. Okay, so no emailed submissions. Uh, it must be received as a hard copy. Um, okay, so uh, very briefly, let me uh, review with you the requirements of the article choice. This is a good chance for you to think and make sure that you're following directions. Only research articles. You know it's a research article if it has a method section, if it has some experiments described in it, and an experimental section that discusses how the experiments were done. Now sometimes those experimental sections are found in the supplementary material that's online to accompany the paper. So nowadays when papers are published, um, typically it's published as kind of a abridged version, and then there's a second uh, supplement that's also published on, online um, concurrently. And that supplement includes a lot of details that are too uh, voluminous to fit in the paper. Okay, journals, journals have a requirement that you can't exceed a certain number of words and it can't include a certain number of figures, but there doesn't seem to be any requirements on the supplement. So what people typically do nowadays is have these monster sized supplements. So um, last year, for example, I published a paper that was four pages long and then it had like a 25 page supplement. Uh, single spaced, you know, 25 pages with like an additional 15 figures or something like that. So that's not all that unusual. Um, and so if you can find uh, in that supplement materials and methods or experimental, or if you could find it in the actual journal article, then you know that you're looking at a research article, not a review or news and views. Okay, and then again, uh, here's the journals that we're going to be uh, using for this. Um, one thing I need to caution you about is that this is the nature, nature of the magazine or nature of the journal, not nature pharmaceutical reports. Okay, there's probably 25 t journals that have the title nature in them. Only two of those are acceptable for this, for this uh, project. One of them is nature and the other one is nature chemical biology. All of the other variants on nature will not be acceptable. <laughs> Okay, so um, Macmillan, which is the publisher of Nature, again, has a large number of journals and they might say slash nature on them, but um, unless they were actually published in Nature or Nature Chemical Biology, they're not acceptable for this project. 
okay? And again, if you give me something and you didn't follow directions, I'm just gonna hand it back to you ungraded and tell you to redo it and give, it, and give you a late uh, grade for that assignment. So it's essential that you get the journal article correct. Um, yeah, question over here. Uh, this question is kind of for the whole class. Yeah. I tried to enroll in Turnitin.com yeah. and it didn't work and I was wondering if it worked for anyone else. Did anyone have trouble with Turnitin.com? You had trouble as well? Oh, so everyone had trouble. Yeah, like. Did anyone do it successfully? No. All right, thanks for uh, pointing that out for me. I will have to take a look at that. Um, Miriam, can you make a note? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for letting me know. That's good to know. Um, last two points. Uh, must have been published in uh, the last year. Uh, it needs to have the number 2012 or 2013 on it. And it must clearly focus upon chemical biology. So it has to be a, a chemical biology article in the definition of chemical biology that we're using for this class, which all of you know. Okay? Thanks for pointing out about turning in. Any other issues that are coming up? Um, an issue that came up in my office hours is how do you find a journal article that's relevant to your interests? Um, I'm hoping you all know about PubMed. Uh, there's ways of restricting PubMed searches to specific journals, and I encourage you to use them, okay? Now, if your interests are um, exceedingly obscure, like um, you're only really interested in, I don't know, dermatology, it's possible there were no chemical biology articles that uh, covered you know, epidermal cells in the last year. Okay, so it's possible that you won't find any chemical biology stuff going on in that field, um, in which case you might want to pick another topic and expand your interests. Okay, but if your interests are like HIV or something, there were probably a dozen chemical biology relevant articles published in HIV last year. Okay, maybe even more, I don't even know. Okay, so it's possible you might have to change around your, your topic a little bit um, to suit what's available. And again, I highly encourage you to choose a topic for this assignment that will then lead you into your proposal, right? That way then you're reading a, a, a state of the art paper and when it comes time for you to propose something, you can basically take what was in the paper, apply that, and go one step beyond. Okay, that's a really good way to be creative. Read something that's really cool, get inspired by it, uh, bring in some new technique or something like that, and then before you know it, uh, you're on your own. Okay, make sense? Okay, any other questions about the uh, assignment? Anything like that? Okay. Um, I want to talk to you very briefly about scientific writing. As we've already discussed, um, this is a major portion of the grade, and uh, it's really uh, essential for your future career. Um, I believe very passionately in uh, the ability to, uh, that, of the importance of effective writing. So um, I want to give you a few guidelines. These aren't hard and fast rules, rather they're guidelines that if you follow, I guarantee you, to you your writing will be uh, significant, substantially better than just everybody else is writing. Okay, so the first of these is strive for simple, direct, clear sentences. Think of your job as being like a journalist, a reporter. You want to have like a Hemingway S style, meaning really short declarative sentences where each sentence is clear. At this point, um, your goal is to make your uh, writing as clear as possible. Okay, the absolute clearest possible. And uh, the best way to do that is have short sentences. If your sentence goes past about a line and a half, it's simply too long. Okay, there's a good chance that the reader who's going to be reading these things very quickly, right, that's the way everyone reads nowadays, um, will probably not have a chance to keep track of it. And so that should clue you in that it's time to break the sentence up into something short. And every sentence needs to have um, a, a subject and a verb. And if you're choosing a verb, choose one that involves an active voice. Use the active voice. If you don't know what active voice means, uh, please go see um, someone on campus who can help you with writing. There's a writing coordinator who can help you with that. If this business about active voice is totally mystifying to you, get it checked out, okay? You need to know what that means. Um, also along those lines, if, if the earlier thing I mentioned about PubMed doesn't make sense to you, go see the librarian in the science library, okay? There's, there's people who are expert at doing searches for the kind of thing that you're doing, okay? So, um, you know, whatever I'm telling you to do, uh, if what I'm telling you is totally foreign to you and totally unfamiliar, then um, it's incumbent upon you to seek out resources that will help you with this. 
okay? And um, I can help you a little bit during office hours, but uh, there's people who are even better than I am at writing on campus and even better than I am at doing searches. And uh, you should seek them out and use their expertise as well. Um, double check your explanations for understandability or comprehensibility. This is really important. You should be able to take your journal article report after it's written and then hand it to the person sitting to the right of you. And that person should be able to understand it. So um, make sure that it's understandable. That's really the, the true test. That's one of the things I'm looking for in good writing. I should be able to understand what's written. Okay. Um, and then uh, this is really important as well. Um, avoid pronouns that are unclear. This happens a lot um, in this assignment. It's very important that you specify precisely the objects and subjects of your sentences. Okay, so by pronouns, I mean things, I mean words like they, uh, it, um, you know, things like them, them these. Those types of words uh, are inherently unclear. So what happens is you'll have some sentence like, you know, uh, bile acid drives up uh, production of immune cells or something like that. And then the next sentence, it will say, uh, these, uh, these are terrible effects. And what I don't know is whether these refers to the immune cells or the bile acids. It's just not clear to me. And I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, oh, if he spent a little bit more time on it, it would be clear. But um, that's not the way you want to uh, communicate. You want to communicate so that the reader has one and only one interpretation of your writing. And again, um, if you avoid pronouns where it's unclear exactly uh, what's, uh, what's being referred to, you can make your writing much more precise. And that's one of the things you strive for in good science writing. Okay. Questions about uh, science writing, about style? This is the style that I want you to follow um, when you turn this in. And this is how I'll be thinking about it when I assign grades to the written section of your report. Okay. Questions about the style? All right. Um, I want to talk to you finally about plagiarism. Again, this is one of those things that drives me crazy every year, no matter how many times I talk about it. This will be the last time I discuss it, though. And the reason I'm going to discuss it with you now is um, I'm aware that not everyone knows what plagiarism is, or certainly everyone who gets caught doing plagiarism claims that they don't know. So we're going to talk about it and define it very precisely. Okay, so plagiarism is borrowing someone else's words. And a relevant question is how many words do you have to borrow before it counts as plagiarism? Okay, so in science writing, obviously, you're going to be borrowing some words, okay, because you're going to be discussing the same sort of thing. But what I'm interested in is your own thinking about those words. Okay, so for example, if you're writing about able kinase um, or this able protein, then I'm expecting you to borrow that word able. It's unavoidable. You can't get around it without borrowing that. But what I'm interested in is how you think about able, your own thoughts about this protein and your own spin on this. Okay, so for example, if a particularly um, uh, clever sentence is something like, although compounds that are effective in vitro prove to be so two cytotoxic for cellular assays, the reported inhibitors provide a proof of concept for the efficacy of disrupting ABLE. Okay, so that's the example that you found in the literature and you, um, you agree with this, this makes sense to you, and you want to have a sentence like this in your own report. Um, let's talk a little bit about what plagiarism would be if you borrowed this. Okay, so what happens is what students will avoid or what students will attempt to do is they'll go through and they'll do a, a map to map uh, version of the same sentence up here um, but in their own report. And this is what I call plagiarism. So for example, they'll replace compounds with small molecules and they'll replace effective with acceptable activity. And they'll say instead of in vitro, they'll say outside cells, two cytotoxic, prove toxic. Um, cellular assays in vivo, the reported inhibitors, the reported molecules, uh, demonstrate proof of concept, effic efficacy of inhib disrupting, inhibiting. Okay? To me, that's plagiarism. Okay? You've basically stolen someone else's thought. Okay? Now, admittedly, um, you have used different words. You've done a one-to-one -one mapping of different words, but you haven't told me anything new. And I don't care about someone else's thoughts. I care about your thoughts. The goal of this assignment is for me to learn about your thoughts. 
Okay, and the reason why I'm telling you this is not that I don't know that the whole world is all about ripping off stuff off the web and you know putting uh, a new name on it and stuff like that. That doesn't bother me. That's not uh, my concern here. My concern here is that I learn how creative you are and how um, effective you are at uh, reading something and then interpreting it in a new way, in a way that hasn't been interpreted before. That's the goal of this assignment. So the goal of the assignment is not to simply recapitulate someone else's ideas. The goal of the assignment is for you to tell me your own ideas, and that's what I want to grade. I want to grade you and not someone else. And so that's why I care about plagiarism. Okay, so let me show you how to do this so that you avoid plagiarism, okay? So this one down here, this would be okay. Okay, so what you do is you take this sentence and you think about it a little bit. Okay, and you, um, you start to say, well, you know what, the problem here is first the sentence is kludgy. It's a mess. It violates the rule about too long a sentence, right? It's complicated. Short declarative sentences are better. So you're going to break it up. You're going to say the compounds reported in this paper were too toxic for cell studies. That's unavoidable. Okay, right? This is a fact. There is no way that you're going to escape not being able to state the facts. You can put the facts in your, your report. In fact, you need to. It's the second part that interests me more, which is the interpretation. And what, you, what is said here is, the report, however, advances cancer therapy by describing a novel mode, a small molecule inhib inhibition, disruption of ABLE. Okay, so what you've done here is you've put the report, this report, this scientific discovery, in the context of the larger field, which is cancer research. And then that's your spin on it. Okay, that's what you've done to help me know um, about your creativity. Okay, and that's really where, uh, that's the, the value added that I'm looking for in a good uh, scientific communication. Okay, I know that you're gonna have to restate the facts. You might even have to restate some of the experimental methods. That doesn't bother me. What I'm really interested in though is how you interpret those facts, how you spin the facts, how you put them in the context of chemical biology and in the field and um, in cancer research. That's the part where you get the, the A grade. Okay, that's the part that interests me. Okay, that's the part that I can say, oh wow, this person is thinking in a unique way. That's the part that really I'm looking for in this assignment. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and I'm not trying to scare you about this plagiarism stuff, but it is scary because um, later in your career, you can get fired from your job for even small amounts of plagiarism. The, the great historian Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, was caught out, uh, you know, borrowing something like uh, half a sentence. Half of a sentence was enough to tarnish uh, a lifelong of work where she had achieved so much. And um, don't let that happen to you. Okay, that's not, it's not, uh, it's not fair for all of your hard efforts. Okay, so you do not want to be in that position. And so now would be a time to, uh, to resolve not to um, let that happen. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts or questions about plagiarism? Does this make sense? I'm not giving you a definition, I'm giving you an example. Hopefully the example makes total sense. If it doesn't, ask now. Okay, so again, um, I will uh, be searching for, I will have the TAs actually doing Google searches and searching for this. It's very easy for us to spot. And um, if we do, we do come down very heavy on this, very hard, because this is an academic integrity issue. We will report people to the dean. Uh, there will be serious consequences. I don't want it to happen. And so if we manage to have a whole year where we have two assignments with zero plagiarism, then I'm going to bump the grades up that are on the, the interface between uh, A's and B's and B's and C's. Okay, so that's that will happen for the whole class. So there's a stick, the stick is the dean's office, and there's a carrot, the carrot are higher grades. Um, help me uh, get to the carrot side. I will tell you, I've been offering the carrot now for many years, and um, I've never, ever been able to deliver it. This could be the year, okay? I know, it depresses me. That's why I keep talking about this stuff, because every time I have someone in my office, they're like, oh, I didn't think that was plagiarism. Well, now you know. All right, any questions about this concept? Okay, oh yeah, Sorry. yeah. Oh, I'm so, so glad you asked that. Okay, so this is brilliant. 
OK, so the question I got was, um, what if you use this first sentence, and then right after that you put a number 2, and that's a reference down to the, the paper that this, was, this came from? The answer is no. That would not be acceptable, because um, you'd still be uh, claiming that these words are your own words. Okay, the way that would be acceptable to use this would be to use the first sentence, the published sentences, put it in quotation marks. Quotation marks designate that you borrowed it from someone else and then put the reference back down to the citation. Okay? That's really, really important. Everyone who plagiarizes includes references, not everyone, but 90% of the people put references to the stuff that they're plagiarizing from. Okay, and it doesn't count. That still counts as plagiarism, even if you reference the stuff that uh, the source that you, you borrowed the stuff from. So, um, let's see. Are you here just visiting or are you here for the class? All right, welcome. Here, why don't you have a seat? So that way then you'll be comfortable. So I just don't want you to look so uncomfortable for the whole no, class. No, right. So, okay. <laughs> well, I do worry about it. Have a seat uh, here or here. So, <laughs> okay, you get the hot seat. Um, okay, any questions about any of the announcements? Any of the questions? That was a good question. All right, uh, let's move on. Um, here's what we saw last time. What we saw last time is RNA is this malleable polymer that folds upon itself as it forms Watson Crick and Hoogstein base pairs. And this malleability um, is a really fantastic property because it gives this biopolymer lots of different shapes to allow it to access um, different structures. And these structures, as we're going to see today, um, confer function. Okay, so one of the themes of the class is that structures of biopolymers leads to their function. Form follows function in biology. Not always, but most of the time. Um, we talked a little bit about different base pairs. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that the molecules we're talking about, the transcription factors, the enzymes, the RNAs, these are dyna dynamic molecules. These are molecules that live and breathe, that have motions associated with them, that have kinetic and dynamic parameters associated with them. One of the dangers of teaching a class like this is that I show you a bunch of pictures of beautiful molecules. Okay, it's like going to the zoo or something. But um, instead of being at the zoo, you're at a zoo where everything is frozen in place. And you know that's not really the way animals exist. You know animals like to move around. They like to be roaming around the savanna or their cages or whatever it is that they're doing. Biomolecules similarly move around. They have dynamics. And when I talk about something like a transcription factor and I describe it riding the rails of the phosphodiester backbone, I really mean it. That is exactly what it's doing. It is cruising on that uh, DNA pieway as it looks for the correct uh, base pairs to grab onto. This is essential. You must start thinking about these molecules as having a fourth dimension of having motions associated with them. Um, and this is one of the frontiers in chemical biology. And it's an area that we need to continue to push and explore and understand better. Because in doing so, we're getting a much richer view of how things are happening inside cells. OK, I'll try to continue to emphasize this point. Um, we talked a little bit about how transcription factors scan DNA sequences at very high speeds and then they form distinctly different interactions upon finding the specific sequence that they want to bind. In other words, they're um, zooming along these phosphodiester rails and when they find that particular uh, uh, correct structure, they kind of scrunch down and they form interactions either directly with the DNA bases or indirectly through water molecules with the DNA bases. And that's what allows them to bind to a particular sequence of DNA, recruit the other uh, factors that are required for transcription, and eventually recruit RNA polymerase and kick off transcription. At the end of uh, Tuesday's lecture, we introduced you to this yeast 2 hybrid screen. This is a very powerful tool that allows us to test protein-protein interactions in cells. It's used um, pretty ubiquitously. I would say um, last few years its use has fallen off a little bit, but it's still one of the major uh, 
tools that are used in, um, say, biochemistry, molecular biology laboratories, and even chemical biology laboratories. I told you about the variant that had two binding partners. There are, however, variants that have three binding partners where you can have, say, two proteins that are kind of like the, the bread in a sandwich and then a small molecule in the middle that's kind of like the meat in the sandwich. And the three of these things have to come together before the transcription takes place. And then it's also possible to look for things that push apart the interaction if you're turning on, say, a toxic gene. And so that's called the reverse two hybrid. And so there's uh, you know, half a dozen or so different variants of this yeast two hybrid available, this yeast hybrid idea that are available, and, but they're all based upon the idea that you can separate out the activation domain from the DNA binding domain. And in doing so, um, you end up with something that then can be recapitulated, that can be reformed uh, upon an interaction, upon formation of an interaction. Okay, any questions about what we saw on Tuesday? Questions about anything like that? All right. Well, um, I want to move on then. I want to talk next about uh, translation. And uh, actually, I think I have just a little bit more to talk about in terms of transcription and uh, messenger RNA. And then we're on to translation. OK, so let me get to where we left off last time. Okay, so last time I ended with the observation that uh, bacteria and eukaryotes um, have very uh, different levels of uh, complexity in terms of their mRNA processing, right? Where bacteria uh, have DNA that's transcribed uh, and then this mRNA leads directly to translation. Whereas um, eukaryotic cells have um, DNA that's transcribed and then um, uh, introns or inserts are cut out, the exons are rejoined, and then the mRNA is modified. At one end, there's a poly A tail that's added. At the other end, there's a cap. And all this must take place before translation can actually uh, happen. So why don't we dive right in and take a look at a, uh, a little bit closer at the uh, chemistry of eukaryotic gene translation or sorry, um, the chemistry of mRNA processing before translation. Okay, so um, here's, uh, you know, here's a little uh, short, let me just get some water, sorry, so it is very dry. Um, short summary of um, what the uh, changes look like. Okay, so again, DNA leads to transcription, you get this RNA transcript. The RNA transcript is first capped at the five prime end. And there is this uh, G, uh, methyl G cap that's added. And this is kind of a weird looking thing, right? It has um, a triphosphoester uh, diester um, uh, backbone. And it has some weird linking. Uh, this is five prime to five prime. And then you have this cap over here. But um, this evolved in a way to allow the mRNA to be uh, shuttled very quickly to the ribosome. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a moment. Um, at the other end, the three prime end, the uh, messenger RNA is tagged with a long sequence of A's. So this is called a poly A tail at the three prime end. And then finally, the um, introns are spliced out. They're actually chopped out. Um, they're either chopped out by an active process involving other proteins or sometimes just spontaneously. And then finally, the leftover stuff, the exons, are actually expressed as protein. Okay, so there's a lot of modification that takes place after the messenger RNA is synthesized. And why don't we take a closer look at this? Let's start with this uh, GTP cap. Um, this is the triphosphate. There's the triphosphate over here. Um, this is uh, a weird looking uh, uh, sequence. Notice the extra methyls. There's one here, there's one here. Um, other than that, it looks kind of like a G. Um, this uh, has the function of helping to load the um, five prime end of the messenger RNA onto the ribosome. Okay, so it gets things going. The way this bond is formed for the uh, methylation event is um, distinct from, I'd say, 
of carbon-carbon bond forming reactions in biology, but it's also number two in terms of its importance. So um, for that reason, we should take a moment to uh, talk about this. First, um, let me just uh, digress for a moment. Um, we'll talk later about how 90% plus of carbon-carbon bonds are formed in biology. They're formed using an aldol reaction. <coughs> this actually is a rare example of a carbon-carbon bond, or, oh, sorry. This is actually not a carbon-carbon bond. This is a carbon uh, heteron bond. This is a rare example, though, of forming a bond to carbon, not through um, an aldol reaction. Um, OK. This is actually uses an SN2 reaction. And it's a straightforward nucleophilic attack by the lone pair on this nitrogen. Notice that this lone pair is not involved. It not involved in aromaticity. So it is a very good nucleophile to attack the methyl group of this s methionine. S-adenosylmethionine has a role of delivering methyl groups. Okay, and actually, now that I think about it, this is, that uh, phrase up there is not so helpful to us. Okay, so um, apologies. All right. Now, on, that's on the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. On the 3' um, prime end, uh, there's an appendix, uh, uh, a um, series of A's that are appended. And um, the num exact number varies, but it can be really long. It goes between 50 to 200 bases of just poly A that are simply stuck on there. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this is a total waste of energy for the cell. Why would it bother doing this? Okay, what is, what is up with that? And um, this is useful because it binds to a poly A binding protein. There's a protein shown here that evolved to bind to these poly A's and that helps direct the, um, the uh, mRNAs to the ribosome. Okay, so it turns out that's actually a useful thing. So these two ends of the messenger RNA act as specialized handles where they have a directionality. And directionality, as you know, matters a lot in, uh, in the sequences of RNA or DNA, right? There's only one direction that leads to a correct sequence. The other direction leads to gibberish. Um, now, because all of the messenger RNAs are appended with this uh, poly A tail, there's a really effective way that we can use to isolate all the messenger RNAs from the cell and throw away everything else. So what you can do is you can set up a solid support that has a bunch of T's bound to it, okay? And then hybridize that to all the stuff found in the cells. The only things that will stick are the messenger RNAs which have a poly A tail. Okay, so in practice, the way this works is um, we use the uh, carbodiamide DCC, um, which we previously saw for forming amide bonds back in Chem 51. But here, we're going to use it to form um, phosphodiester bonds. And uh, what you do is you simply um, add an excess of T, uh, 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 deoxy, or sorry, uh, this is T monophosphate um, and uh, with this DCC and then in the presence of cellulose this will um, react with the cellulose, the primary hydroxyl of the cellulose. Notice that this is cellulose. Cellulose of course is uh, beta D glucose that's polymerized and um, here's the primary hy six uh, hydroxyl of uh, the glucoses and that will react with one of these T's and then the T's will polymerize with each other um, in the presence of this coupling agent DCC. Mechanism here is exactly like what we saw when we saw formation of amide bonds using DCC back in uh, sophomore organic chemistry, back in Chem 51. And um, if that mechanism is not apparent to you, please go back to your uh, sophomore organic chemistry textbook and look it up again, okay? Relearn that mechanism. That's a useful one. Okay, in any case, what you end up with then is basically paper that has a bunch of T's covalently linked to it, a poly T, uh, just sequence, just kind of hanging out there in space. And um, you then solubilize this, you dunk it in water, and you flow over this the extracts from the cell. So almost everything in the cell washes uh, past the, um, the, the paper, except for the messenger RNAs, because the messenger RNAs are now going to form Watson-Crick base pairing. A's to T's. So you have poly A on the messenger RNA, poly T on the cellulose, and the two of these hybridize to each other, and that allows you to isolate 
all of the messenger RNAs and wash away all the stuff that's found in the cell. Make sense? Okay, so this is very routinely used, but I don't think most people uh, th spend too much time thinking about how this is synthesized. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's talk about the next step in the processing of messenger RNAs. So after, um, after they're, uh, after they're capped on one end with the GTP cap and on uh, the other end with the poly A, um, the introns have to be spliced out. There's a bunch of SNRPs, um, short nucleotide, uh, ribonucleotide uh, repeats that um, are, are that sort of pig pile on the introns, bring stuff together and set up a transphosphorylation reaction. Okay, this is where you get a transfer of a phosphodiester uh, bond from here to here. So it's just a simple exchange. And that has the effect of cutting out the intron in this interesting lariat structure. Details here, not so important for us. Okay. Um, this does, however, bring up the really interesting observation that uh, RNA is capable, capable of catalyzing reactions. And this is kind of our first example of this that uh, we're looking at in some detail. So I want to show you a more canonical example of um, RNA acting as a catalyst. And that example is the classic um, hammerhead ribozyme. Okay, so here's the structure of the hammerhead ribozyme in green. This is a um, naturally occurring RNA sequence. And in red, this is a sequence of, mess of um, RNA that's targeted for cleavage by this, um, by this hammerhead ribozyme. And what the hammerhead ribozyme does is it orients a base close by to the 2' hydroxyl to deprotonate that 2' hydroxyl. There's also a magnesium bound and that sets up a nucleophilic attack on the phosphorus of the phosphate. Um, this is starting to look really familiar. Right? We've seen ways to cleave RNA before, and you know what? This is identical to it. The only difference here is that the um, polymer organizing this, uh, this, this, or catalyzing really, this attack um, happens to be an RNA. And so whenever we see a, a catalyst that is an RNA that's catalyzing some reaction, we're just going to call it a ribozyme. Okay? So it's like an enzyme, except it's made out of RNA. Okay. Um, recently, my colleague uh, Andre Luptak uh, discovered that these self uh, that these RNA um, are these ribozymes are very widely dispersed across all um, creatures found on the planet. Um, he's found them in humans. He's found them in starfish and a whole series of other organisms. Um, again, all of these require magnesium. Magnesium is playing this key role as a Lewis acid. It's stabilizing the, um, the negative charge that's surrounding this uh, phosphorus and making it a better electrophile. Okay, so um, in the cell, the cell has a messenger RNA and then um, it has to eventually degrade it. So the cell, ha and, and furthermore, the cell is um, uh, you know, constantly uh, coming up with stuff that, uh, you know, that's getting bombarded with, say, viral RNA. So there has to be a mechanism of destroying RNA after it's finished. Okay, so after its time has come, after the translation has taken place, there needs to be a way of degrading the messenger RNA. And for that matter, it's useful to be able to degrade um, RNA that's coming in from, I don't know, uh, viruses and things like that. So. Um, this has been taken advantage, okay, so the way this works, um, one way to target messenger RNAs for destruction is to use an antisense uh, DNA. So the antisense DNA will recruit, will after it hybridizes to the messenger RNA, it will recruit ribonuclease H and this will then destroy the, um, the RNA, okay? So this idea of using antisense DNA as a way of um, targeting specific messages sent out by the cell um, would be amazingly powerful, right? We'd have a way, say, of shutting down cancer if we can target specific uh, messenger RNAs that are associated with cancer. This would be very, very powerful. Okay, so um, in recent years, um, there's, or not recent years, this has been going on for like 20 years, 
um, there's been uh, attempts to develop antisense therapies. These are therapeutics that will do something exactly like this. They'll deliver a sequence that hybridizes to specific messenger RNAs and then recruits ribonuclease H to degrade that message and prevent it. Okay, this is distinct from conventional uh, pharmaceuticals, which, t which often feature a small molecule that inhibits some enzyme. Okay, so the standard way to do this would be to allow the messenger RNA to tr be translated, resulting in an enzyme, and then destroy the, or not destroy, but disrupt the enzyme by inhibiting it using some small molecule inhibitor. Okay, and we saw examples of this, right? We saw, for example, chloramphenicol targeting chloramphenicol acetyltransferase, right? And so in this case, um, we're, instead of like targeting the enzyme that results from translation, we're going to kill the message itself, prevent translation, and in this way, uh, prevent this enzyme from doing its function. Okay? So it's a really distinct mode of uh, therapeutics. And it's, um, I would say, a couple of years ago, up until, say, two or three years ago, I was deeply skeptical about the whole thing. But um, there's been recent progress. Uh, I believe there's uh, now two drugs that have been approved by the FDA based on this principle. And things are starting to look a lot stronger. Okay? Here's what the problem was. Here's why this took so long. Okay? So here's one example of um, a, a FDA approved drug that uh, uses this, um, this principle. Uh, the drug is called Formavirsin and it targets uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus, um, RNA. And it does this um, by, uh, so here's the form of Ersen. It forms perfect Watson-Crick base pairing with the CMV RNA. Um, and that in turn recruits RNAs H, and which are the scissors to chop apart this um, sequence. Okay? Now the real problem here is that um, uh, these, these um, sequences, the antisense sequences, oh and notice that they're called antisense because they have to have the Watson-Crick base pairs. Uh, so instead of having it, uh, it, so there has to be C's and G's and A's and T's lining up. Although I'm looking now and that doesn't look so neat from this illustration, but you know what I mean, right? So here's T's and A's and G's and C's lining up. So um, that's why they're called antisense. But a major challenge is delivering in these biopolymers in a way that they can actually get inside the cell and be effective. Uh, challenge number one is that both DNA and RNA are pretty short-lived outside the cell. We've already discussed RNAs. There's plenty of RNAs that are circulating. Uh, there's also plenty of DNAs. Um, those tend to chop apart wayward strands of DNA or RNA that happen to be floating around. Okay, so um, what people have been doing is modifying the backbone. So instead of a phosphodiester backbone of this antisense therapeutic, instead one of the oxygens has been replaced with a sulfur. And that backbone modification prevents the degradation of the uh, targeted sequence. Okay, so that's one thing that's happening. Here are some examples of other backbone modifications. In one, the um, phosphorus is replaced entirely with amide bonds in a peptide nucleic acid. And perhaps the most effective examples of these are these morpholino oligonucleotides that um, have this weird morpholine type um, of backbone. Uh, these tend to work really well. Okay, these morpholino oligonucleotides are used routinely in chemical biology and biology laboratories as a way of knocking out specific messages. So you can take some mRNA, take that sequence, convert it to an antisense, and then order up a morpholino oligonucleotide, which incidentally is not cheap, but it can be done, and uh, you can then use this directly in your experiments. Notice that the big change here is a change from having lots of negative charge on the backbone to having neutral backbones. Okay, that helps quite a bit in terms of delivering the therapeutic inside the cell. Right? Negatively charged things have trouble passing through the phospholipid uh, membrane layer that surrounds cells. Right? We talked about how this is, it has an outside that's polar and an inside that's hydrophobic. Charged things don't like fitting through that, pol that uh, hydrophobic region of the phospholipid uh, plasma membrane. And so for this reason, these neutral things um, are more effective. Yeah. I was just wondering what is at the bottom of the translation between the segments? 
Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this means it doesn't happen anymore. There really should just be a big X here. Okay. Okay. Thanks for asking, Anthony. All right. Let me show you. So I've, I've said before this is useful in the laboratory. I want to show you an example of this. Okay. So what we're doing here is um, we're interested in targeting a particular um, messenger RNA that encodes this vimentin gene. Okay. And if the vimentin protein is produced, it will be stained using an antibody um, and the antibody happens to be dyed red. So you will see it under a uh, fluorescence mic micrograph image. And I think I'm going to turn down the lights even more because this is a little hard to see, but it looks a little bit better on my, so I'm just going to turn these off very briefly. Um, so here's cells in blue. This is the nucleus being stained with the um, fluorophore DAPI. It happens to um, bind well to DNA. I think we might have even seen a little bit about it earlier, uh, seen its structure earlier. And again, in red, this is the vimentin protein. Okay, so this is basically um, the con negative control. This is um, short interfering RNA that um, does not target the vimentin gene. And it's really essential that you do these controls, okay? So you've treated these cells with uh, RNA, but in this case, it's RNA that doesn't have the antisets necessary to target the message uh, encoding vimentin. Okay, now over here, here are cells that have been targeted using this siRNA, which again is this RNA interference uh, mechanism that we've been talking about. Um, but now the antisense targets the mRNA that encodes vimentin. And notice that there's very little red. There might be a little bit here, but for the most part, it's totally clear of the red, yet you can still see the nuclei of the cells. Right? You can still see these blue nuclei, which is the DNA of, in the nuclei being stained. Okay? Can everyone see that? Okay, so this works really well. All right? And again, the, um, the way this is going to work in this case is um, you have um, a plasmid that encodes this siRNA. Okay? And furthermore, it's even more complicated than that. Um, what you do is you actually set up uh, so you have this plasmid. Remember, recall that plasmids are circular DNA. Um, the plasmid encodes um, the, uh, the sequence that's going to be the antisense sequence. And in, um, in, and in practice, this actually encodes not something that's simply an antisense sequence. Rather, it encodes both the sense and the antisense sequence into a hairpin. Okay? So over here, this upper strand is the sequence, the mRNA, it looks kind of like the mRNA uh, that encodes the vimentin gene, but it's just a little fragment of that. And then um, there's a little uh, hairpin, right? That's a loop that we've seen before. And then down here on the lower strand, this is the antisense sequence. So sense, antisense. Okay, so now what happens is um, this short hairpin is now a section of double-stranded RNA and that activates um, a mechanism in the cell called DICER. Okay, and DICER goes through and systematically looks for any sense strands of messenger RNA that have the sequence and catalytically goes through and starts chopping those apart. Okay, and it chops one after another apart. Okay, and if you want to learn more about DICER and Argonaut and the other proteins involved, you can read about it in the text. Okay. All right, um, let's uh, switch gears. I want to, sw any uh, questions about uh, mRNA processing? Questions about that topic? Okay, it turns out it's a really active area of research. Um, it's always been active, it's always fascinating. Uh, there's new surprises that are constantly coming along. I want to switch gears though. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what happens next. Uh, the messenger RNAs are eventually delivered to the ribosome. Um, in prokaryotes, the ribosome binding site, or RBS, is something called a shine delgarno sequence. Um, it's more of a guideline than a sequence. Um, you can actually get away with some variations on this shine delgarno sequence. Um, but it turns out that if you don't program it in, uh, nothing happens. Okay, and uh, every so often, uh, you know, someone new joins the laboratory and designs uh, their protein, you know, their, their construct to be expressed, and nothing happens. The cells refuse to take it up, but it's because they've forgotten this Shine-Delgarno sequence. So it is essential. 
in eukaryotes, um, there's something called the COSAC sequence, and this idea is the same. There's an uh, area where the messenger RNA uh, is bound by the, the ribosome, and that kind of gets everything going. Okay, now the actual ribosome catalyzing uh, amide bond formation is a pretty straightforward reaction. Simply consists of um, a means attacking esters. Okay, so recall from back in Chem 51 that if you mix together amino acids and you boil them for a long time, you can form an amide bond. But uh, the efficiency was very low and you didn't have control so much over um, which amide bond was going to be made. Okay, so we talked about why it was important to activate the carboxylate of the amino acid to form an amide bond with greater specificity, right? Um, if you were in 51C with me, we had this conversation. And again, if this conversation about activation and DCC is totally foreign to you and totally uh, confusing, uh, go back and take a look in your textbook from sophomore organic chemistry. Okay? So DCC, I've alluded to twice in this class, and both times I've told you if you don't know what it is, go back and look. Okay? Um, so in this case, the cell doesn't have access to DCC. Okay, instead, its activation agent is um, forming the amino acid into an activated ester. Okay, so here's an amino acid, it happens to be methionine, um, and R over here is the transfer RNA. And so what's going to happen is the, um, this will form an amine bond with a N-terminus of a nascent peptide um, that uh, will attack this ester. Okay, so this will be the first amide bond, and um, the second one will be the next amino acid delivered to attack transfer RNA of this, uh, of this threonine, et cetera, okay? So the ribosome is stringing together these transfer RNAs that have activated amino acids attached to them. So I'm going to be referring to these activated amino acids as amino acyl tRNAs, where acyl refers to the fact that these are formed into ester functionalities. Okay, make sense? Okay, and furthermore, it makes sense that we have this activated ester. Um, another way of thinking about this is that hydroxide is a terrible leaving group, and so instead of having hydroxide as a leaving group, we have um, alkoxide. It happens to be a special alkoxide in a catalyst, et cetera, but um, that's the idea. Okay? All right. So um, chemically, what's happening here is the um, incoming amino acid is attacking this ester. Okay, so this is a straight um, uh, attack of a, a carbonyl. Um, and then uh, you form this tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate then collapses, and the result is um, formation of an amide bond. And I have two possible mechanisms here. Um, one that can take place under basic conditions on the top and one that takes place under acidic, more acidic conditions on the bottom. Either one of these is legitimate, okay? And both of them lead to formation of an amide bond. Okay, straightforward mechanism. It's one that I'm hoping you're familiar with from back in the day. Um, and if not, go home, try it a couple times for yourself. It should be pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's take a look at the ribosome itself. The ribosome is really a mega machine. It's a huge machine that has upwards of 20 different parts to it, constituent parts. Um, these include both proteins, um, which are shown here in blue, and also RNA sequences that are all kind of put together. Okay, so here's the messenger RNA being read, um, and then here's the peptide being spit back out of the ribosome. Uh, notice that the, the action site, the site of action, called the active site, is in the very center of the ribosome. And if you look at the center of the ribosome, it's mainly RNA. Okay, so in fact, the ribosome is a ribozyme. It actually it relies upon RNA to catalyze this aminolysis mechanism that I showed you earlier. Okay, let me see if I got everything on here. Okay, so a mixture of RNAs and proteins, et cetera. Okay, um, here's, uh, it turns out that because it plays such a key role in the cell for uh, protein translation, it's also a major focal site for antibiotics 
to target. Um, it's hard for antibiotic resistance to emerge with this one because um, it's hard to not mess up the ribosome without uh, losing its catalytic efficiency. It's just too important for the cell to start messing around with. And so um, many antibiotics target uh, the ribosome. And uh, one of these, for example, is the antibiotic tetracycline. Uh, tetracycline binds directly in um, the active site up here, and it also has a lower affinity binding site um, down here. Okay, and it's shown in purple. Okay, so uh, tetracycline, routinely given anti-acne med medication, uh, effective way of killing off bacteria. It happens to um, have slightly higher affinity for um, the bacterial ribosome than the human ribosome, but the differences are fairly subtle. Okay, so here's the structure of tetracycline down here. Um, it has four rings, hence the name. And again, this targets the ribosome. There's a whole series of um, different molecules that target the ribosome. Things like canamycin, erythromycin. This is another one that should be familiar to those of you who have bacterial infections at some point in your life. You've probably encountered erythromycin. Okay, it's a macrolide antibiotic. We'll talk more about these polyketide antibiotics in a, uh, in, a, in a few weeks, probably towards the end of the class. But it also, it targets the ribosome. Uh, streptomycin also targets the ribosome. Totally different structure. Um, this is a, an aminoglycoside antibiotic. Um, and then there are antibiotics that target not the ribosome per se, but the machinery that helps to load tRNAs up onto the ribosome. And uh, there are two ways of doing this. One is targeting EFTU, shown here, um, keramycin, and another one is targeting another protein called EFG, uh, which is this one over here. In any case, all five of these molecules operate by a common mechanism. They all operate by shutting down protein translation for the cell. Okay, so this is one of those areas where it's just really rich with lots and lots of different antibiotics. And um, we'll see this time and again, right? We talked about uh, molecules that target DNA. We talked about molecules that target uh, the, the ribosome. There's sort of like Achilles heels for the cell, areas that are real choke points that antibiotics can get in and mess up pretty readily and do it in a broad spectrum way where they're killing lots and lots of different uh, species, really, of bacteria in this case. Okay, so let's talk about translation. So translation starts with a start codon. In eukaryotes, the start codon encodes the amino acid methionine. Um, so the N terminus of all, um, uh, all proteins synthesized in eukaryotes um, starts off with a formal methionine. Notice that there's this formamide that's been appended to it. Um, that's just another way of getting things going. Um, in uh, so, in it, um, oh, sorry, this is the bacteria case. Bacteria starts with the formal methionine, eukaryotes, no formal methionine. Um, let's take a closer look at the tRNA. tRNAs, again, bring amino acids to the ribosome as activated esters, as amino acyl tRNAs, okay? And at one end of the uh, ribosome, uh, or sorry, one end of the tRNA, the three prime end, the amino acid is loaded in as an ester. Way down here at the other end, there's uh, three bases called the anticodon, which will try to hybridize to the messenger RNA. And if they hybridize, that tells the ribosome that it's the correct sequence, uh, uh, the correct amino acid that's being loaded in for amide bond formation. This is really essential, this base pairing between anticodon and codon loops. This is what allows the um, correct, the synthesis of the correct sequence, right? Otherwise, you know, you have your DNA, DNA up here, your messenger RNA and your proteins. This, this is the last step, really, in the uh, central dogma of uh, molecular biology. This is what gives you the correct sequence that was encoded by the DNA in the first place. Um, okay, now, um, Here's the way this works. So uh, the, uh, the messenger RNA is read out in three base pair sequences called codons. Okay, each one of three bases leads to a different amino acid. And I'm showing you uh, what the amino acids are of the 20 amino acids on um, this uh, genetic code diagram. Okay, now here's the way you read this genetic code diagram. You start in the center and uh, this tells us, let's just start with G. 
Okay, so if the first um, residue is G and the second one is C and the third one is, is C, so GCC would lead to alanine. Okay, CAG leads to glutamine. Uh, UGA, however, leads to stops. Okay, so there's two possible stop codons. Uh, sorry, three possible stop codons that are useful. Um, those tell the ribosome, kick it off. You know, kick off the messenger RNA, you're done. Okay, and that stops the sequence. Um, okay, so there are 64 possible combinations. There's only 20 amino acids plus some stops. So um, what this means then is that several codons encode for the same amino acid. Okay, and in practice, there's some slight preference for some uh, codons over others. And this preference is dictated by the levels of tRNA. So there are some tRNAs that are present in higher concentrations in the cell. And in practice, when you design uh, protein overexpression, you look for uh, codons that are more popular than the less popular one. There's some codons that are exceedingly rare inside the cell. And if you have a choice of, say, um, four different codons. In the case of 3D down here, you'll choose the most popular one. Um, I don't remember what it is, but you would choose, let's say, ACC rather than ACU because it's uh, represented more often in the uh, genome. Okay, so um, here's the way, it, here's what it looks like. Um, DNA has a sense strand and an anti-sense strand. Mm. During um, transcription, uh, a copy again is made of the sense strand and then this copy is translated out. Um, the sequence up here results in um, the amino acid protein sequence down here. So for example, ATG um, we've seen is a star codon. I didn't call it a star codon, but we know it encodes methionine, okay? ATG, okay, methionine, right? Okay, so this encodes methionine and over here, ATG as a codon at the DNA level results in methionine down here, okay? Similarly, GTG, GTG encodes valine, and so over here results in valine, okay? And so you can do this pretty readily if you have one of these genetic code, uh, you know, wheel diagrams that, I'm that um, is in the book. So you can very readily figure out what a uh, sequence of protein will result, okay? Make sense? Okay, um, now, crucial step. At some point, you have to load the correct amino acid onto the tRNA. If the amino acid is mismatched with the anticodon down here, the cell is in big trouble, right? This is essential to get the correct uh, sequence out. And so um, uh, enzymologists debated for a very long time how the molecular recognition of the tRNA would work with, with recognizing just three bases of the, um, of the anticodon loop of the tRNA. And in practice, what we found is actually the enzyme responsible for this loading, an enzyme um, uh, called uh, aminoacyl tRNA synthetase, um, this enzyme is a monster. Okay, so it forms a dimer. It's shown here in green. These are two tRNAs, one on the left side, one on the right side. And notice how this thing is just grabbing onto both of these. So it's interacting not just with the anticodon down here to read out the sequence, but with lots of other places along the tRNA. Um, and then furthermore, up here, this is the active site where um, the, amino acyl, um, the uh, amino acid forms an ester bond with this three prime hydroxyl. I'll show you in a moment what the uh, mechanism of that reaction is. But again, notice that the uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase engulfs the whole tRNA. It's in a bear hug. And so there's more interactions than just the anticodon loop. And furthermore, earlier, do you remember I told you how uh, tRNAs especially were very heavily modified? Back when we were looking at, say, the cloverleaf structure of tRNA, I said how heavily modified they are. That heavy modification helps direct the correct tRNA over here um, to the correct amino acid up here. And it's being read out by this um, protein, by this enzyme that's checking it over. Okay? Make sense? All right, so um, let's take a closer look at the mechanism. Um, in practice, um, 
the uh, mechanism involves activating the carboxylate because again, carboxylates are very inert. They don't like to be, um, they don't like to form uh, bonds all that ready. Hydroxide is a bad leaving group. And so in practice, um, this is activated by um, forming a um, acyl phosphate intermediate using ATP as the activating agent. Okay, so phosphate is kind of like nature's tosylate or mesylate. It's some super leaving group that's ubiquitous, that's found all over the place um, in biology. And this is going to work by um, forming a readily hydrolyzable bond. Okay, so for example, um, the glutamyl tRNA synthetase um, starts with glutamine, or sorry, glutamic acid, glutamate, and um, uh, uh, activates this uh, through an acyl phosphate intermediate. And um, then the uh, glutamyl tRNA synthetase asks, okay, is the acyl phosphate intermediate available, glutamate, and if it's not glutamate, then it hydrolyzes this intermediate. And if it is, then it adds the um, uh, amino acid to the three prime hydroxyl of the tRNA. Okay, so it's a little bit complicated. There's actually um, a couple of steps where things are checked. Um, the uh, tRNA is bound and it's gripped in a big bear hug uh, where it's actually making sure that it has the correct tRNA, making sure by testing the anticodon, but also looking along the length of the tRNA. And then um, different intermediates, uh, acyl phosphate intermediates, are brought up to the active site and the enzyme asks, is this the correct one? Is this glutamate? And if it's glutamate, then it forms a bond. And if not, then it kicks it off. And when it kicks it off, it actually hydrolyzes the um, phosphate of the, um, the, the phosphate intermediate. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, way in the back. It's insanely wasteful, right? You're burning ATP to do this. So um, the cell invests an enormous amount in uh, protein synthesis. Okay, which is one of the reasons why cells hate doing overexpression if they can avoid it. Okay, there's a huge selection against, uh, you know, when we do protein overexpression in the lab and turn cells into factories for producing proteins, they would love to be able to avoid doing that effort if they could. Okay, there's a huge amount of wasted effort here. ATP is getting burned. Okay. Great question. Other questions? Okay. Um, so I told you that um, in bacteria uh, and prokaryotes, um, they all end with an N-formal group um, at appended to the N-terminus. There's an enzyme called peptide deformylase that hydrolyzes off this N-formal group. And in um, eukaryotes, humans, um, oftentimes the start uh, methionine is hydrolyzed off using methionine aminopeptidase. This is simply a protease that hydrolyzes the amide bond here. Okay, so it gets in there, hydrolyzes that amide bond, but does it specifically on the N termini of proteins. Turns out this is also a potential target for antibiotics. Um, so, for example, um, the, the, um, the natural product fumig fumigillin. Um, inhibits angiogenesis, which is the growth of blood vessels um, in, uh, in uh, human bodies. And um, it does this by using a very interesting mechanism. So the natural product naturally has a three-membered ring and epoxide that is precisely positioned next to a nucleophilic imidazole functionality. Recall the midazole functionality. We talked about it on Tuesday in the context of RNase. Here, we're seeing it again in an enzyme, a different enzyme active site. It's also neutral. Um, it's also has, this has, again, the PKA of seven that we saw. And so therefore, its lone pair is likely um, available to act as a nucleophile and be covalently modified uh, when it attacks this epoxide. Okay, so this is an example of a suicide inhibitor. It's suicidal because it gets in and then um, it uh, revert, well in this case it's sort of reversible, but oftentimes irreversibly modifies the um, enzyme active site and in doing so kills the enzyme. Okay, I actually personally hate that word suicide inhibitor. Um, I actually prefer Trojan horse inhibitor, which is a better word. Um, it was coined by uh, Conrad Block, who's a little bit of one of my heroes. So anyway, I'm, uh, but 
it, it's caught on, so it's hard to do. Okay, now, why would you want to inhibit angiogenesis? Blood vessel growth is great. If you're at the gym working out, you certainly want to have uh, blood vessel growth to feed those muscles that you're building, right? Okay, now the problem is when uh, tumors start to grow, they have a voracious appetite. They are desperate for everything. They need more nutrients. They need more oxygen. They, um, they're really hungry, okay? And so they will attract blood vessel growth to them to feed the resultant tumor. So an important anti-cancer strategy targets that blood vessel growth and prevents the blood vessels from growing. Um, those drugs are called anti-angiogenesis drugs. They inhibit angiogenesis. And for some reason, inhibiting methionine aminopeptidase is a strategy for blocking angiogenesis to block the feeding of tumors, preventing their, their growth, and hopefully getting them to shrivel up. And it turns out that's actually an effective strategy when it's combined with other anti-cancer uh, uh, therapeutics. Okay, so um, in addition to what I've shown you, there are higher levels of regulation taking place inside the cell that are regulating um, translation. And um, these are things, uh, here's my favorite. I'm just going to describe one of the many possibilities. Um, my favorite is a, um, uh, a messenger RNA that at one end has its um, ribosomal binding site, its RBS, hidden um, in a hairpin. When the temperature in the cell is increased, the Watson-Crick base pairing of this hairpin breaks apart, exposing the ribosome binding site and then allowing the message to be translated. That's really elegant, okay? That's the kind of elegant design that I really love. And in theory, um, everyone in the class could design temperature sensitive uh, sequences that would get turned on uh, at specific temperatures, knowing, for example, the Wallace rule. Okay, now, um, we've talked about how, to, how this happens in the cell. Uh, we chemists um, are a creative lot, and we're constantly looking for new ways to, um, to tinker with stuff and try to get better control over things uh, inside the cell. And one really exciting area that, um, has been, um, that has been really taken off in the last few years, but has been applied for roughly 20 years or so, um, is the idea of incorporating unnatural amino acids into proteins. And so to do this, um, what, uh, what chemical biologists have been doing is hijacking the naturally occurring amino acid synthetases that are found in different organisms and then um, co-opting them into loading specific amino acids, uh, unnatural amino acids. Oftentimes, these amino acyl synthetases are, are modified. They're mutant proteins. So they're modified to accept unnatural amino acids. This is an analog of an amino acid tyrosine that would usually have a hydroxyl over here, but now has an amine. And that's really a cool experiment because now you can test what happens when I put a better base in place of the hydroxyl. If I put an aniline functionality in place of a phenol functionality. Um, it turns out this is really uh, powerful. Uh, it's something my own laboratory applies. We apply it just as a tool. There's other laboratories that are trying to extend it to other areas. Um, it's really, uh, it's something I encourage you to use in your proposals, okay? It's basically bread and butter technique used in chemical biology laboratories that eventually will spread to biochemistry labs as well. Um, the thing is, you can do all kinds of stuff if you can incorporate a natural amino acids. For example, you can incorporate metal chelating amino acids, um, amino acids that form covalent bonds in the presence of UV light to form crosslinks. This is an example of a photo affinity tag. Amino acids that will um, react specifically of carbohydrates and amino acids that will form crosslinks in the presence of other functionalities such as an azide. So this is enormously powerful. Um, and again, I encourage you to just use it. Um, it's uh, a very routine um, technique at this point. Okay, this is something that actually uh, works well enough. I have an undergraduate in my laboratory, a uh, former Chem 128 student who's doing it as we speak. Okay, and it actually works pretty well. Um, and that really impresses me. Okay, or, you know, he's basically taking a technique that, uh, that is described in the literature that our laboratory has never uh, applied before and getting it to work. Okay, any questions so far? 
All right, I want to switch gears again. I've, we've talked about translation. We've talked about incorporation of natural amino acids. I next want to end with a discussion of um, aptamers and RNA sequences that uh, bind or catalyze reactions. Mm. Okay, so um, it turns out that you can make very, very large libraries of RNA. I mean, I'm talking enormous. You can make uh, on the order of 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14th different sequences. Okay, so that's a one followed by 14 zeros. Okay, and you can have the, all those different sequences in a little tiny Eppendorf tube, small test tube. Um, and from there, you can do all kinds of experiments on them. Okay, so for example, you can identify um, RNA sequences that might catalyze this reaction pretty readily. Okay, and the way you would do this is um, you'd set up, so in this case, you're looking for um, something that will, um, will catalyze uh, um, uh, glyco uh, glycosylation of um, this amine over here. And so the way you will do this is um, you'll have some uh, sequence uh, appended and then you look for all of the ones that have a sulfur incorporated using mercury as a trap. Okay? Okay, so that's kind of the overview. Let's look in at the details. So the key concept here is that sulfur and mercury form a very strong bond and you can pull out specific sequences that happen to have sulfur in the sequence. Okay, so here's the way this actually works. What, the, what you do is you start with some random DNA sequences where N is, is any of the four DNA base pairs. Okay, so you start with the four DNA base pairs, A, C, G, or T in this position, A, C, G, or T in this position, A, C, G, or T, or, and you're probably wondering, how do you possibly synthesize 10 to the 14 different sequences? Well, it turns out it's very easy. At every step in the process, you inject in all four DNA bases during the synthesis of the DNAs. Okay, so rather than just adding A's, you add a mixture of 25% A's, 25% C's, 25% G's, etc. So that gives you a random DNA sequence uh, on the order of 10 to the 14. Okay, so you have like 10 to the 4 different DNA sequences. You then use RNA polymerase. We happen to favor one that's used by a virus. Viruses are very good at um, getting their stuff to the head of the line. They're very aggressive uh, enzymes, um, which makes sense. They evolve they, to be really aggressive like that. And so you can use this T7 RNA polymerase. That will then convert the DNA sequences into random RNA sequences. Um, and then you can look for RNA sequences that incorporate sulfur. Okay, and so here's your, your compound that you're looking for a reaction with. If it incorporates sulfur by some transition state, then you can isolate that sulfur using a bond between mercury and sulfur. Okay, and um, the mercury is attached up to some solid support, like the carbohydrate that we saw earlier, like the cellulose that we saw earlier when we talked about the poly T column. Exact same idea. Okay, so now the only RNAs that will get isolated are the ones that have sulfur incorporated that have reacted specifically with this compound. So you go from 10 to the 14th just down to, I don't know, 20 or 30 that are doing something. This is really powerful because if you get, 10 to, if you get a trillion or a hundred trillion different sequences together, there's a good chance that you can find one or two that do something special in your sequence. And you can imagine evolving this. You could take that sequence, um, mutate it further, make changes down here, redo the selection, and then do it a bunch of times. In practice, we often go for like 10 rounds uh, with these RNA libraries. And um, these are often called aptamers. They're RNA sequences that bind to some target. The inventor of this whole idea is going to be here at UC Irvine next week. Okay, so some of the pioneers uh, in this area are um, famous uh, here at UC Irvine. And um, uh, a guy who's the uh, president and CEO of a company that's set up around this concept will be here at UC Irvine giving a seminar next week. I'll send you the details. I encourage you to go to his seminar. It's gonna be big. Um, he's kind of a heavyweight in the field. Okay, last thought. Um, there's an antibiotic called pyromycin, which manages to sneak into the ribosome and um, form covalent bonds by mimicking the amino acyl tRNA. Okay, um, I don't know why I have this here. Uh, it doesn't look so interesting. Let's skip that. 
Okay, let's just end here on Aptiverse. Uh, so when we come back next time, we'll be talking about my favorite topic, proteins.